Well, good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Southern Baptist Church. We are so excited that you're here to worship with us today, whether it's in person or watching us online. We want you to know you are our family, and we're excited to have you here with us. We're going to begin today by singing Victory in Jesus, hymn number 426. How many of you know Jesus already got the victory for us? All right. We still have battles to face, don't we? But the war is already won. All right. And so no matter what's going on in your life, the victory is won. All right. Hymn 426. share this morning boy we've been so busy from october all the way to the end of the year and um now we kind of get to take just a little bit of a break but um don't forget today is lunch whether you brought anything or not we want you to stay in fellowship with us and then we'll have a business meeting right after that okay um the youth are having a valentine's banquet for us okay that'll be on february 5th we'll get time and all those kinds of things to you a little bit later on Okay, so just some things for you to keep in mind. Soul food, we will be doing um, at the last Saturday of the month. And what is it we are having? Uh, beans and cornbread. Beans and cornbread. All right. And so 
as we get closer to that date, we'll have some more information for you about that as well. All right. We've already had some prayer requests and things before we started. So remember to pray for one another. We got lots of our church family going through lots of things right now. And not just our church family, but others that are close to us. And so just a lot of things happening, a lot of people sick and um, COVID back on the rise and just a lot of things. We need prayer, don't we? We need to pray for one another and we need to cry out to God for his prayer or for, for him to work and move in mighty ways. All right. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Tom if he would open us in a word of prayer, please. Emmanuel means God with us at church and school, at home, at play. We can find God in everything. Don't believe me? Watch this. I got a Graham's condenser with me today. It's part of a apparatus that you use for distillation. Uh, chemists and uh, uh, scientists, um, people that work with herbs would use this and you would use it to um, purify or refine something that you want to uh, make. So if you had um, mullen, this time of the year, people like mullen tea uh, or mullen abstract. Uh, it's supposed to be good for a lot of cold type things. Well, of course, for tea, you could just take the leaves and you could put that into it. But if you want to get the extract of mullen, how do you extract, how do you get the pure mullen out of it? Well, you would put it into a device, and you heat it. And the heat separates the mullen, the pure mullen, out. And then this gram condenser condenses it back, and it drips out the end. The pure mullen liquid drips out the end, and you have the pure stuff. You know, the Bible talks about refining the process of refining, and how that God sometimes has to refine us in the fire of trials. And that's not very much fun, is it? You know, to be tried, to be heated up, to be, to be worked over is never any fun. We just assume to be able to sit back and put our feet up and say, oh, I like resting. But that doesn't get rid of the extra. And sometimes we need to get rid of the extra. We need to be purified. We need to get rid of the world and find out what's real the strength that God has inside of us already. And so he sends trials to get rid of the fluff and develop the strength that's in us. And so that heats us up and then runs us through another device and out comes the purified quality that 
that God wants to develop within us. So next time that you're in a trial, or like Pastor said, you're coming out of a trial, you're going into a trial, but there will be trials. So next time you're seeing a trial, don't try and run from it, but know that God is working and He's going to be refining you and giving you that quality coming out the end that's going to be very helpful for you. So let's fold our hands and close our eyes. God, we don't like the trials. They hurt. But thank you for walking with us in that trial. And thank you for that quality of whether it's patience or love, endurance, whatever that quality is that you're trying to make in us. Help us, Lord, to find it. Be with our moms and dads. Be with our church family. Each one that as they walk with us during that trial, help them to understand and to be there too. Bless the rest of the service now, we pray. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's your challenge for the week. Search for God in everything. You'll be amazed where you'll find it. Thank you, Brother Richard. You know, Richard is so smart and intelligent, I feel like he's on a Clydesdale and I'm on a Shetland pony sometimes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> All right, we want to continue our worship service this morning. <laughs> I don't know where it came up there. All right, hymn number 407, Because He Lives. Let's go ahead and stand. Guys, in the trials of life, as he was talking about trials, and we've talked a little bit in Sunday school during prayer request, do you realize God is still in control, isn't he? And I know sometimes we don't... That's the last thing we need to hear at that point, okay? But because he lives, man, think of the ramifications of the resurrection. We sang victory in Jesus a while ago. Because he lives and overcame death, he overcame sin, he overcame the grave, he overcame everything that we fear the most. It makes life a little bit for us as Christians, that's why Paul says for us as believers, yes, we go through times where we grieve, but we don't grieve as those without hope. All right? Life is still hard. It is still sad. We still face those trials. But because he lives and he lives in us, we can face tomorrow no matter what it brings. All right? Because he lives, 407. <clears throat>
glad he lives this morning? Man, I'm glad he didn't just die on that cross and that's the end of the story. Because he'd just be a martyr then, wouldn't he? But because he rose from the grave, conquering death and hell and sin, man, he proved he is God and he is victorious. I like that part. One of these days, we're going to cross that river, and then we're going to see <laughs> and experience real victory then, aren't we? Whew, man, that just... Mm. If that doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. All right? So, man, we're going to talk about prayer here in just a moment. And because he lives and because the Father loves us so much, he came to this earth as one of us. And he died on that cross because no matter what we're going through, guess what? In comparison to eternity, eternity is far more important, isn't it? Where we spend eternity after this life, it doesn't negate the things that we're going through, but it kind of helps put things in perspective. We're going to talk about prayer and why we pray. And guys, we have a Father in, who, in heaven who cares about us. You're going to see in one of the illustrations I'm going to use here in just a little bit. Our Father wants us to love Him. <laughs> he wants us to desire to have a relationship like with Him. And we don't have to wait till heaven for that. And I know this is a familiar course, and we've sang it before. But the psalmist David said this, he said, just as the deer pants for the water, he said, my soul longs after you, O God. I want you to think about that as we sing this chorus. Okay? Take this familiar chorus and pay attention to the words. Does my heart thirst after God as much as we should? And let's make this a prayer to him this morning. <clears throat> As the
thank you for this time that we have, we've had to come together. Lord, to worship, we do pray for those that are unable to be here this day, those that are missing from our congregation. I pray, Lord, for each one that's been mentioned by name for a special prayer this morning, the elder sickness, Lord, the traveling, the loss of a loved one, uh, those in the nursing homes, Lord, we do pray for them. Now, Lord, I pray you just bless this message that uh, Brother Mike is about to bring us this morning. I pray you open our hearts and our ears that we can hear it, truly understand it, and apply it to our lives, Lord. Lord, we pray you help us to truly be a witness for thee. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, while you remain standing, get your Bibles, and we stand in honor of reading God's Word. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. It'll be up on the screen if you don't have your Bibles ready. All right, I've got verses 5 through 9. I'm actually going to start at verse 1. Um, that was my bad. I forgot to put that down there. I don't know why there's a one, 5 there instead of a 1. Um, it was my fault. I did that, obviously, because I printed that out. So, <laughs> so Matthew, chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now this is where we want to really start. This is the focus of our scripture this morning. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. We're going to stop right there. May God add the blessing on the reading of His word. You may be seated. How many of you are like me and you find at times in your life your prayer life is really strong and you're really doing good in prayer? And then all of a sudden you find yourself not being very consistent and you feel like your prayers don't even go any farther than the ceiling. Is that, is that just me? No? Okay, well good. Then, then I'm not just going to be preaching to me this morning. All right, because man, I hate when that happens. All right, so that happens too often here lately, it seems like. My failures in my prayer sometimes seem like they weigh, are way heavier or are far more than my successes in prayer. Okay? And I'll tell you, prayer is one of the areas that God has probably grown me the most in, and yet I still find myself being so inconsistent. And I'm going to tell you from the start, this has probably been one of the hardest sermons that I've worked on. I spent more time praying, and you'll see why here in just a minute. I mean, I spent a lot of time getting this sermon ready and praying about it and having it preached to me before I can preach it to you. And part of that is because of my inconsistencies. Because sometimes I see unanswered prayers, and it seems like they outweigh the answered prayers. I think we all feel that way sometimes, don't we? We feel our prayers are ineffective many times. Um, but if we're honest, how many of our prayers are asking God to do things? A lot, isn't it? 
I'm going to be sharing with you some things that God really taught me this week about prayer. Man, I've written devotionals on prayer. I've preached on prayer, taught on prayer. And there's some things that God really got hold of me about this week. Um, sometimes, I think part of the reason that Jesus included this in there, knows how many times he calls him our father, and he tells us we should call him our father. Okay? You know, as we study prayer, I can remember one time <laughs> we were at a church in Ohio, and there was this one man there that when we would call on people to pray, and you know, a lot of times, Sometimes guys will tell me they don't want me to call on them to pray. Sometimes guys say it's okay to pray. I called on one guy one time, and he didn't want to pray. He was embarrassed. I was embarrassed, and I, it was an awkward situation. But we had this one man in, in this church in Ohio. Man, I've heard some beautiful praying. It's probably the best I've ever heard. I mean, in public praying, boy, that guy, nobody wanted to pray the next time anybody called on him to pray because they're all measuring up to this guy. And man, he was just that good. But what does Jesus tell us about prayer here? He says the effect of prayer, the prayer he wants us to concentrate on, is not what we do when I call on Mike or Richard or Lee or Tom or anybody. Man, the kind of prayer he is talking about is what you do in private. Your quiet time. Okay. Yes, this is important prayer. We call ourselves together and corporately we come before the Lord. And don't get me wrong, that's important praying. But God is way more interested in how we pray when we are in private. Okay. And if we're honest, that's where we feel like we're the least successful in our prayers, isn't it? We feel sometimes that we just don't get a hold of of the Father. Maybe the reason our prayers are so weak is because we're praying for the wrong reasons. One of the hardest things that I struggled with this week in this prayer is that every one of us have things that we pray about a lot. Okay? You guys know some of the struggles we've had and that we've asked prayers for. I don't want to say things that are online, but you guys know some of those prayers. And I can't tell you how much time I've spent praying over that. A lot. Okay? We all have, for some, it may be relationship problems. For some, it may be money we all have some situations in our life. It may be health. It may be something else. We all have situations in our life we spend a lot of time praying about. And maybe we don't see very much answers in it. I remember one time, in one of the tough times that, we, that I've been praying about, that God, it was almost like he spoke out loud. And he said this. He said, I wish... You spent as much time in prayer seeking me as you seek for an answer to this situation. Think about that. I wish you spent as much time seeking me as you do an answer to your prayer request. It hit me hard. I think he has said it before. I just wasn't listening. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one that's like that. Sometimes it takes a couple times to tell me before I get it. <laughs> All right. So why do we pray? Man, I tell you what, there's been times that I've prayed and prayed and prayed and don't see God move, at least in the way I want him to. And I've even said that. I've even asked What's the use of praying? What's the use of praying? Anybody else ever say that? Why should I even pray? Well, Jesus answers that to begin with. Now remember, in Luke's account of this prayer, 
And, and I like Luke's account because in there the disciples come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. And I'm sure they did here. Matthew just didn't record that part. Okay? But think about this for a minute. The disciples saw Jesus do lots of miracles. They heard his teachings. And they got from that prayer was the reason for all of that. Man, Scripture over and over and over tells us Jesus went to pray. He went alone. He spent the night praying. He went by himself to get away and pray. I mean, we find reference after reference of Jesus getting alone to pray. The disciples realized there was a correlation between Jesus praying and all that he accomplished. Now, if Jesus... Being the Son of God, being God himself, thought prayer was so important. Think how much more important prayer should be to us. I mean, if Jesus, who is God, prayed about every situation, went alone to pray, spent a whole night sometimes praying, shouldn't we also pray? So, in one of those times that I was struggling, and the Lord showed me, said, I wish you sought after me as much as you seek for an answer to this. He reminded me, he says, how much time do you really spend seeking for me? He said, I'm your father. And he reminded me that he brought me to this passage where he says, we pray like this. And Jesus told his disciples, we pray to him saying, our father who art in heaven. That's why I want you to think about this morning. Why do we pray when our prayers feel ineffective? Because we have a Father who is in heaven. And because we have a Father who is in heaven, number one, we should seek the face of the Father. If you're following in the bulletin on the back, you see the blank there, seek the face of the of the Father. See, God made us different than all the rest of creation. Mankind is the only one who says he formed out of the dust. Mankind is the only one he breathed life into him. He's the only one he had a relationship with that he walked through the garden and talked with him and fellowship with him in the evening. We find that, remember, after Adam and Eve ate the, the fruit, we don't know what it was, but it came, it says, as was the custom, they met in the cool of the evening with the Father. So we know they had a relationship with him. God created us because he wants to be your father. That's why we're different than the angels. The, diff- the angels have to serve him. The rest of the animals don't have a soul like we do, and they don't have a relationship with the Father like we do. We are different than all other creation. God created us for a relationship. It's the whole reason you and I exist. Not just to serve him, not just to build his kingdom. We're going to talk about those things, and those are important, and that's what he has for us, but his reason to create us is to have fellowship with us. Now, in any relationship, you spend time with people that you love, don't you? You try to find out what they... Okay, guys, when you were dating and trying to win over your spouse, guess what? You did a lot of research, didn't you? trying to find what their favorite food was, their favorite color, their favorite this and that. You spent time with them. Man, you wanted to go on dates. And yet, statistics show that Christians spend very little time 
in communication with our Father. We call on Him when we're in trouble, when we want something. (laughs) But to really spend time with Him because He's our Father. Man, we should want to know everything there is about Him. See, we're designed for relationship. In fact, he went to great lengths to restore our broken relationship by coming to this earth as one of us, dying on the cross to redeem us, to buy us back, to give us victory over sin and over death, to let his presence indwell in us. He went to great lengths to restore our broken relationship. As a father, he loves us. Why is it so many times the only part of the father relationship we think of is him spanking us and disciplining us? It happens, doesn't it? But when it happens, he does it out of love. But if we're honest, we don't get disciplined nearly enough, do we? We don't get as much as we deserve. Why is it we don't focus on the love part of the relationship? How much he loves us. See, he wants to be our father. John 15, verse 5. And because we, he is our father, we should want to know him and know everything about him. John 15, verse 5 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then ask whatever you shall. Okay. We like to focus on the, just ask whatever you shall and it'll be given to you. And we like to claim that as a promise. Let's say, wait a minute, we're missing the whole condition for this promise. And that is us abiding in him. We talked a little bit about this either last week or week before. When you graft a branch into a tree, another tree, okay, what do you do? You put those together and everything that is in that tree flows through and goes into that new branch. To abide in him means, guess what? We've got to spend time with him. If you don't spend a whole, if we don't spend much time with him, we can't say that we're abiding in him. We say we love him, but we spend very little time with him. Prayer ought to be our highest priority. Not just a priority. The psalmist got up early to pray. <laughs> Jane is my hero in that she gets up 4 o'clock. I didn't know 4 o'clock came twice a day. It does. Okay. To spend time with God. Others, spending time at night is the best time for them. It doesn't matter what time of day you pray, but it needs to be a priority in our life abiding in him getting to talk to him and by the way lord showed me this too he showed me how much of my praying was just me doing all the talking i started finding out it was a lot (laughs) and trust me god god's taught me a lot about prayer i can spend an hour and a half easy praying and sometimes i do that he showed me one time, says, you know how much of that hour and a half you spend listening? It wasn't very much. It wasn't very much. Communication works both ways, doesn't it? Notice the rest of that part, John 15. Not only abide in me, but my words abide in you. We spend time talking with him. But he talks to us primarily through his word, doesn't he? I challenged you last week, okay? And I hope you're taking me up on this challenge. It's not too late to start. But I challenged everybody, not only spend time in prayer, but to read your Bible. We talked about one-year Bibles, okay? You can read through the entire year. Read through the entire Bible in one year. A lot of Sunday school material has plans on the back for helping you with that. 
Maybe you don't want to read through the whole Bible. That's okay. But are you reading his word? And not just glancing through it, saying, okay, there, I'm finished. Because <laughs> I found myself, at times, I can do that too. I read through the Bible every year. And there's times, man, I get behind and I'll read two days and I'm like, all right, got caught up. You know what I remember about what I just read? Zero. Because my goal was to get through it instead of it getting through me. <laughs> okay? See, we can do all the right things. We can spend time praying, but us doing all the talking. We can spend time looking at God's word, reading through it, but it not really speaking to us. That's why the Bible talks about meditating on his word, letting it speak to us, thinking on it the rest of the day. Okay, that's what biblical meditation is. It's not that you have to be sit there with a scripture in your hand all day long, but you think about it. And you know what? I have never read through the Bible where there is not something in there that is either new to me or that God reveals to me for the first time or something that doesn't touch an area of my life, something I'm going through, or something that just to gain knowledge. Sometimes it's just for that, just to learn something new about him. What are we really seeking when we go to prayer and to Bible study? Abide in me, he says. And then you see, I put another one on there. Seek his face. Why would I put that? Remember in Exodus, Moses had been up on the mountain. This, this is the second time he received the Lord's the commandments. And Moses was hungry for God. And he said, Lord, I want even more. He said, I want to see your glory. And remember the Lord said, hey, nobody can look at my face and live. And he covered him and he let him see the backside as he passed through. You know what I've discovered? Because I, I, I've asked the same question myself and I hear others ask it. So why is that person so close to God? And they seem that God just works through them and does great things. Why is it? You know what God told me one time? And this one really hurt. He said, you're as close to me as you want to be. Whew. You know why that person was close to God? Because he spends time with him. He said, if you want that, you spend time with me. I was like, oh man, that one hurt. And guys, it's true for you. You're as close to God as you want to be. You spend as much time with him as you want. If you're not spending much time with him, guess what? That means he's not a priority. I know that hurts. That hurts to hear that. But you know it's true deep inside. <laughs> you're as close to him as you want. David is another one. In one of his psalms, he said, I will seek your face, not just your hands. In other words, he was saying, I don't want to seek you for just the things you can do. I believe most of us think God can do anything. We have that kind of faith. We believe he can do anything. He's God. There's a contemporary song on radio out that says, I'm trying to remember part how the part of this course goes, it says, Help me to want the healer more than the healing. Help me to want the provider more than the providing. Again, it's what, just exactly what God was showing me. I wish you spent as much time seeking me as you do the answer to your prayers. That's what it means to seek his face. I had somebody one time tell because I, I, I made the statement, said we should never be content where we are in our relationship with God. And somebody thought they were being spiritual. Oh, well, the Bible tells me I need to be content. The Bible tells us we need to be content with things, material things. 
It never tells us to be content and okay where we are with God. We should always want more. I mean, you think of David and Moses. Moses, the Bible says he was the only one that God called his friend. <laughs> but Moses wanted more than that, didn't he? David, one so close, he wrote all these hundreds of psalms and did all these great things for God. He still wanted more. One of my main questions to you this morning is, are you content where you are with God? I hope not. I hope not. Number two, why pray? We have a Father in heaven. Seek his face. But number two, okay, and this is the part we focus on, but it should be the second part of the prayer. It shouldn't be our main focus. Our main focus is to seek his face. But guess what? Because he is our father, sometimes our prayers move the heart of the father. Okay? And this is important. Okay? Did you know Psalm 58 or 56 verses 8 and 9 says this, that our prayers go up to heaven like an incense before God as an offering. Think about that, because that's not the only reference. Also, in um, Psalm 141, verse 2, it talks about our prayers being a smoke, rising up to God, a sweet aroma that he enjoys. Revelation, chapter 5, verse 8, and a couple chapters over in 8, verse 4, talks about the prayers of the saints. And then God pours out his wrath. Why? Because he's answering the prayers of the saints. It talks about the bowl being filled with the prayers of the saints. In all four of those pictures, guess what? He's telling us how important our prayers are to him. Never think that your prayers are not important to God. See, because he's our father, he cares about everything you care about. He hurts when you hurt. His heart breaks when your heart breaks. Have you ever thought of that? Man, I look at the news and my heart breaks when I see some of these things kids go through. Do you know his heart breaks? His heart breaks when you hurt. His prayers are important to you, or your prayers are important to him. So much so that he gives us those four illustrations. Four times he says, man, I keep them bottled up. And one day at the right time, he's going to answer those prayers. Now, I know the two references in Revelation, he's talking about the prayers of the saints that were being persecuted, and then God pours out his wrath on those that persecuted those saints. But guess what? The meaning is still the same for us. That he cares deeply for you. And he keeps your tears. And they're important to him. As a father, he wants the very best for you. Sometimes I think we think, well, God only cares about these super... And I've said this. <laughs> I, I've said this to God. You only care about the super spiritual things. You don't care about this little thing in my life. Guys, there is nothing farther from the truth. Do you know the devil speaks lies to us all the time? And that's what he does to us. We forget God's promises. As a father, he wants the very best for us. In fact, Jesus tells us an illustration in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. And he says, hey, if evil men... Men here on earth that are evil know how to give good gifts to their children. He said, how much more does our Father in heaven want what is best for us? Now, parents, we tell our children this all the time. But we forget that it applies to us, too, in our relationship with God. We tell them, hey, 
I know this is not good for you. You don't understand this, but if I give this to you right now, it's going to hurt you. It's not the best thing for you. Don't we say those kind of things to our kids? Okay. We spank them, a little kid, if they get into the, under the kitchen sink where there's rat poison and Drano and all that kind of stuff. Why? Not because we're trying to spoil their fun, but because we know if they get into it, it could kill them. Okay? Sometimes the reason we don't get the things we want is because it's bad for us. Why don't we, un- we tell our children that? Why is it we don't understand that from God? We think He's just being mean, unfair. Oh, wait, that's the same thing our kids say to us when we tell them that we're doing it for their good. See, he wants the very best for you. As Christians and as humans, we're willing to settle for second, third, fourth best. And I know you're, we think we have all the answers, just like our kids thought they had the answers, and we thought we had the answer to our parents. Well, they don't know what I'm going through. I know what I'm going through, and this is what is best. No, says our Father who is in heaven. He is God. He's the creator. He sees the whole big picture. So sometimes we don't get the things we want. There's a country song that said, um, one of our great, I just went blank on it. Sometimes, what is it? I thank God for unanswered prayer. I think we're going to get to heaven and we're going to thank God for a lot of unanswered prayers that we complain about now. See, Father really does know best. Some of y'all remember that show. Okay? He really does. If God cares so much for us and he wants the very best for us, that he keeps our tears bottled up and our prayers... Guess what? That moves the heart of the Father. Just because He doesn't answer the way you want Him to. Is it still worth praying when we don't see prayers answered the way we want? Yes. Sometimes, do our prayers change the heart of the Father? Sometimes. Remember the story, it says Jesus left, I think it was Capernaum, said he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. We're going to talk about faith another time. That's not going to apply to today. But because of their faith, sometimes it moves the heart of God to do something. It may not always be what we want. I heard somebody say, God answers every prayer. It's either yes, no, or wait. <laughs> okay? That's something to think about. It's either yes, no, or wait. If it's a no, guess what? You need to be content with that. I'm jumping into here in a couple weeks. I need to stop because that's in a couple weeks sermon. All right? But it doesn't mean that your prayers have not moved his heart and touched his heart because he hurts when you hurt. All right? Never stop praying. No matter how ineffective you feel that your prayers are. We need to keep calling out to him. As his children, he hears us and wants the very best for those who call upon him. James chapter 5, verses 16 and 17 tells us, and we'll close with this. It says, we need to pray just as Elijah prayed. And it tells us, goes to great lengths to tell us, Elijah was no better than you and I. In fact, it says in 1 Kings, James tells about the incident in 1 Kings chapter 18, okay? And it says, Elijah was a man just like you and I. You don't have to be a preacher, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, an elder, or whatever. You don't have to be that for God to hear your prayers and care about it. He said, Elijah was just like us, and he prayed that it would stop raining And guess what happened? For three years, it didn't rain. It says, then 
Elijah prayed that it would rain. And guess what? It rained. The first part of that verse in James chapter 15 or chapter 5 tells us the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Last week I hinted this. Guys, do you want this next year to be different as far as your power in prayer and seeing God do great and mighty things and you being closer to God than you've ever been? Me and Lee do. Thanks, Lee. All right. Guys, we have as much as God as we want. And we have all of him. He just doesn't have all of us. You don't have to be anybody special. God cares for you. He wants to do great and mighty things. But even though we can move the heart of the Father to do some things, Make your priority this year, not getting your prayers answered. I know that's going to say, well, why do I pray? Again, the whole point of the sermon, because you have a father that wants a relationship with you. Make the focus of your prayer life this new year being to get to know your father. Abiding in him and his word abiding in you. When that happens, okay, then we start praying the things he wants us to pray, and then God moves. See, Elijah just didn't come up with that to pray on his own for the rain to stop and then for it to start. He was led of God to do that because he was in relationship with God, and because now he was so close to God, he knew God's ways. God revealed it to him. So make Seeking Him, your priority, this new year. While every head bowed and every eye closed. Guys, if you're tired of weak, ineffective prayers, and you want to touch the heart of God, I challenged you last week to spend time in God's Word. I'm going to challenge you this week to spend time in prayer. And I mean serious time seeking Him, not just answers to your prayers. But I'm going to challenge you to seek Him. In fact, as we stand and we sing our invitation hymn, I'm going to ask that you sing it softly and quietly in your hearts. Because, and in fact, I want every head bowed and every eye closed, even as we stand, okay? And I'm going to ask you to do something. If you will commit to pray with me this new year in seeking God as never before, I'm going to ask you to either come to the altar or to raise your hand in just a moment. Not right now. We're going to sing, and I want you to do that while we sing. And our invitation to him, it's going to be, Lord, I'm coming home, 309. I'm going to pray first, and then we're going to stand and sing. Father, we do love you so much. Father, it's easy for us to say, But Lord, if we really love you the way we should, we would want to spend time with you. Lord, I pray that you would change all of our hearts to have a hunger and a thirst for you. To not be content with where we are. To want to see not only your hands, but your face. Father, to see your glory. To know you and to know your ways and your will. Father, help us to want you more than silver or gold and more than answers to our prayers. Father, help us to want to commit to that. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand sing hymn number 309, Lord, I'm coming home. Again, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment with me. I'm standing here before you telling you. I'm making that commitment this year to not just have my prayers answered, but to seek God. Most of you don't know this. I fast almost every Tuesday. And part of that fasting is fasting for this church. But God's redirected me. My first priorities need to be fasting to be right with him. And I'm going to challenge you to make that commitment. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. And you may say, oh, I don't know the words of that song. This, that's okay. As we sing, as the praise team sings that song, if you are willing to make that commitment, I'm going to ask that you stand out and just come and pray with me here at the altar. Or at least raise your hand if you don't want to come to the altar. As we stand, as we sing. Thank you for joining us online today. We look forward to the day when we see you in person. We hope the Lord has used this service to strengthen and encourage you. If you have any questions about the message or are considering giving your life to Christ, please leave your contact information on our web page or our Facebook page with a request to speak to me, Pastor Mike Dillon. If you have a prayer request, we would also like to know that as well. Emmanuel Southern Baptist Church is in your corner looking forward to a bright future. God bless everyone.